guys, it's Norm from Tested. I'm here with Desir Molnar. What's going on? Doing all right. How are you doing? Good, man. Welcome yeah. to the neighborhood. Yeah, it's kind of chilly today. Out it's by the beach. beach. Side. It's always like yeah, this. Yeah, dress, dress well for the beach. Bring your, bring your, bring your jacket and, uh, <laughs> and uh, no tanning requirements. Interesting yeah. place for a rocket scientist to be. Inventor, well, rocket scientist. You have a long history of building rockets. But so do bicycle guys. But bicycle guys have a long history of making things that are really light and, and obviously back to the Wright brothers. They're flying uh, stuff that they knew they could build it with their hands. They knew that it had to be light to fly. And, uh, and that's the same thing I did here was I wanted to build a, a basically a motorcycle that would be light enough to fly. So I hooked up with my friend Craig Calfee who was making lightweight bikes and I said, hey, look, I got this project. Do you want to jump in on it with me? So and this has kind of been your passion project for almost a decade yeah, now. Yeah, it's been about 10 years. Yeah. It's the gyrocycle. Like the gyrocycle, yeah. The flying car. It's the white paper for a flying car. I mean, basically, I, I, I wanted a flying car, and I didn't have any specific uh, ideas about how to get there. And then just by deducing uh, through the problem of, like, how do you really solve uh, being legal? How do you really solve the mm -hmm. things like uh, people are eventually, are, you're going to crash. It's better to crash slow than fast. I wanted to land really slow. I wanted to use not a lot of space. I wanted the thing to be affordable. Uh, I wanted to, as a, on, the, on the ground, to actually outperform the average car. And in the air, I wanted to outperform the average plane. And, and I managed to, I think, put the two together. Right. And we're not just talking about a dream. We're talking about a real thing you've built yeah. and flown, yeah. which is right here. This is the, your first gyrocycle. Yeah, this one was in the air the first time back in about 2005, 2006. And we built it here at the bike shop. And, uh, and the thing that's a little different about this than, than, than most gyroplanes, which have been around forever, it was since the early 20s, mm -hmm. uh, a gyroplane is basically, it's an unpowered rotor blade. This thing would just spin in the wind if I released it. The thing uh, was designed as a, uh, a wing that wouldn't stall. So the, uh, the guy who developed it, Juan de la Sierra, he wanted something that uh, would be safer than the average airplane. Because people would be coming in for landing and then the plane would get a little too slow and fall out of the sky. So with this one, you could fly really, really slow, like 15 miles an hour, basically. Wow. And it'll land in a space about the size of its own blades. So I thought that would really be a good application uh, for a flying car, uh, just to be able to land in, in congested areas. And people have been building gyroplanes. You know, they're Forever, still building yeah. them. They're the kits. Yeah. You can buy them online. A hundred right? years. Yeah, they're not expensive because you don't have to you don't have to attach the engine to the rotor blade. It's mm -hmm. a free spinning thing. And that gyration of putting in all the uh, gear reduction equipment that's that gets very pricey. And so with this, all we do is we use the engine to spin a propeller, and the propeller pushes us forward through the air. And then as you're moving forward, the the relative wind spins the and rotor that blade. That gives you thrust, and, and that, that gives you uh, lift. That's exactly right. You get the thrust from the propeller, you get the lift from the rotor blades. And again, it's, it's a proven method and, and they've been flying for many years. But the thing that I wanted to do that was different was I really wanted to be able to use off-the-shelf off motorcycle engines because they're already street legal. You don't mm -hmm. have to have crazy smog laws or things like that that you have to go around. And also, motorcycles are much easier to uh, get on the street than a, than a car. I talked to a guy, Henry Fisker, recently, and he said it's a quarter billion dollars, basically, to put a car into production just because of all the rules and, and regulations that you have sure. to around. Motorcycles is a very good culture of people that have been building their own bikes for a lot of years. And so um, uh, it's a, they've greased the tracks, basically, for new ideas and innovation. So I wanted to keep it down to uh, uh, less than four wheels, I should say, when we're on the road. And I did that here. We've got just two when we're driving. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I used just an off-the-shelf motorbike engine to spin the propeller so that when I'm driving, I can run the rear wheel with it. And when I'm flying, I simply port the engine power up to the to the rotor blades. What's different about this basically than other gyroplanes is I put the propeller between the engine and the pilot. And the reason for that is as I get bigger and bigger engines as they're simply available uh, you know, in the market, you can, you can make a larger and larger propeller uh, to keep the efficiency high. So that's the big difference between your gyrocycle and a gyroplane. Yeah. In, in terms of flying car, two important parts, flying and the car. And this is still classified as an experimental vehicle. Like this one is an experiment. Yeah, it's an experimental aircraft. And uh, that's a really nice thing that here in the States, you basically fill out three pieces of paper. And, and I mean three, not four <laughs> or two, but there's three. And then a guy will come out and he will inspect it. There's certain things that are expected in an experimental aircraft to make sure that it's safe. Um, and then you go through a testing process with it. But, but basically, the restrictions are extremely small. Yeah, what does that allow you to do? Like, where can you fly this? You can take this to an airport and just Yeah, you take can. Off? What you do is, in the initial stages of an experimental plane, you just stay close to the area where you've all agreed that you're gonna, you've built it, or maybe in a nice remote area like this. Do some testing. You do about 40 hours of testing. And then once you've determined that it's really safe, then you're able to just go anywhere. I think probably 10 or 20% of the airplanes in the U.S. are actually experimentals. Wow. So home-built, home-built experimental you aircraft. Got, you guys built this by hand, you know, yeah. in Craig's workshop. And 
and yeah. the first time you take it out, how, how does this operate? What we did was we actually made a mixer system here. So basically it's a kind of hybrid setup right now where I've, I can control the front wheel with the, with the steering handle. Mm -hmm. But basically we just use these attach rods and we the way we mix them up allows you to either control the thing with as a motorcycle and in this case, uh, I use these control rods to, to move the front wheel and if I was driving right now I would run these other two down to the wheels and what I can do with that by pushing the lever forward and aft like so uh, oh. if it's stuck up in drive mode this becomes will, this like, it's like the yoke well yeah but it will also, it'll pull the wheels in oh, okay. so when the bike is going it's only 24 inches wide I wanted it thin enough that I could stick it in a hotel room and also drive between cars. Yeah, drive between way. cars and put in a hotel room when I'm traveling. <laughs> but but right now what I do is I have it actually set up to the rotor head. So what you can see here is just for flight controls, it's this simple. You simply push this, uh, the, the yoke forward to, to, to tip the down, and then we've got left and right uh, controls. So and when you're is, flying, that's it. It's not like hel a helicopter. Works. No, a helicopter is much more complex. Because that's, have, it's powered and yeah. then the blades tilt. That's right. The blades tilt, you have a swash plate, you have a collective, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, power going to the blades, but this one is effectively a passive uh, device. Everything from the neck down I built, but everything from the neck up is mail order. Those things will be selling for like, you can get a whole rotor right. set for about three so, grand. So you're driving down the freeway, yeah. right? Just like a motorcycle, you pull up the side of the road and then you turn the flight mode and you yeah. just take off. Yeah, that's the idea is that you can basically take an aircraft with you wherever you want to go. So, you know, for me, I didn't design something to commute back and forth to my job. At, this is uh, not you know, a commuter, so, no. I, I, I wanted something I could leave and not come home. You know? Oh, okay. So, so with this one, we've got a pneumatic tube here where this thing will all drop down. So the, so the rotor head gets really nice and low and the bike packs up really small. So basically at the end of the day, I got something that flies really nicely. Uh, it'll do more than 100 miles an hour. It gets 60 miles to the gallon. So it's a very simple engine. It's a one cylinder four stroke. Yeah, so you said that's the first one and this is built, you know, half a decade ago. You've been working on the second revision of the gyrocycle. Yeah. Let's go to the workshop and take a look at that. All right, cool. All right, Desher, we are here in Craig Calfrey's workshop where you have the Mark II. The gyrocycle, is it appropriate yeah. called the Mark II? We call it the G2, so the it's a G2. gyrocycle two. It's, it's uh, the second one, but more importantly, it's got two seats. It's double seats, and also looks like you, uh, yeah. double the, the wheels in the front. Yeah, this is actually, this is the kind of the fourth generation of this particular bike. Again, everything down bottom, we, we, we have to really invent. And yeah. from the neck up, it's all mail order. But we started this one out, originally I had a steering wheel. I had like a Formula One steering wheel on it with mm -hmm. uh, you know, shifting on the dash and everything. And then uh, we changed it to, from that to a handlebar. We did actually a lot of driving with it, with the steering wheel. I've had it up to about 130, 140 with the steering wow. wheel. It's a pretty, pretty challenging thing to drive, but it was something we wanted to know if we could do it or not. There were certain reasons for that. And then um, more recently, I changed out the front wheel uh, with these two front wheels, and it's still able to lean about 40 degrees to the side, so we can still do banking high-speed turns. Now the other thing we've just done is we've added the flight equipment, just the propeller section. Mm -hmm. So we've just grown about two feet. So uh, that's the, we haven't ridden it yet with the new configuration, but I'm hoping it's going to behave just as well. So right so. now, the additional wheel in the front, a little more stability, you're not going to... What it does is it gives us a lot more traction, basically, okay. and it's a little safer. Mm -hmm. The chances of you basically slipping both wheels out are a lot less than if you have one. So, so uh, you know, you're cruising along on this thing, it's nice to know that you've got a lot of traction on the front. Yeah, so it's good And they're narrow, so the main thing about that is it doesn't uh, create any slipstream problems. Right. So the rules with motorcycles are that you have to have the throttle in the right hand. So what we'll do is I'll go ahead and put in a stick for the left. So mm -hmm. when I'm flying, I'll just run the throttle here, and then uh, all the directional control with the gyroplane will be with the left hand. And then I'll add a couple foot pedals. I've, I've just stuck a brake pedal for the rear brake in the middle there, and I'm going to put rudder pedals to the right and left of that. And we've had this thing out, uh, again, like very, very fast, and it's a very, very stable platform. So you had the motor here connected to this main frame, and you, see yeah. you added about that two feet. Yeah, that's and right. And this is a, a new motor. It's a motorcycle motor. Just this a, is a motorcycle. It's a street bike engine, or like right now, we're basically what I've got are the props folded down. But what we have here is just a, you know, a drive, just like you saw a second ago, off the, uh, off the drive output of this, which is a, a sport bike motor. Motor. So the first bike you saw was a one-cylinder mm -hmm. four-stroke, and this is a four-cylinder four-stroke. It's like a thousand-dollar motorcycle yeah. motor, as it's opposed to like an airplane motor. It's going to be like what thirty thirty thousand. Yeah. But it's a Cost street legal too, yeah. And that's that's important. Yeah. The car well, the, part yeah. again. Yeah, and, and most airplane engines run on hundred. Uh, 
octane low lead, meaning mm -hmm. they're leaded gas. So mm. They're not going to drive on the street. And they don't have already a history of being allowed to do that. So by the time you get your hands on a motorcycle engine, it's already done that. And so for us, what we do is rather than have some bizarre kind of a, a reduction drive uh, that's cantilevered out, we simply use the, the, the drive system as literally the backbone of the whole vehicle. And this is actually the strongest part of the bike. People are thinking, oh my God, it's going <laughs> to break. But no, everything, believe me, it will all shatter around this part. But again, the other thing you want to do is uh, if you can have a very large diameter prop, that's the best case scenario. So that's why I have the system here where there's, there's nothing, uh, you know, of the vehicle's fuselage on either side of it. We run the whole, basically we run the, in the aircraft through the prop. Right. And that's All you need to do is if you want a bigger prop, lift up the bike. That's right. And as people, t uh, you know, as, as development goes on, people keep making more and more powerful bike engines. So that way this configuration is basically flexible. So if somebody comes out with a 300 horsepower bike, we can just bolt it in the back and wow. put on a bigger prop and go fly. So a lot of horsepower. Let's talk about like the materials and the weight. So how much does this thing weigh right now? Right now it's probably, uh, it's made out of steel mostly. And it's probably around, I don't know, about 600 pounds that you're looking at. And again, we built this out of steel, which is uh, a really good way to prototype things and get them done. And then eventually you can always lighten them and we can put lighter components on it. And that's what we did with the first bike and that's what we'll do with this one eventually. And you're designing it all on computers first, using CAD no. this time. No, no oh, we just have jumps. a lot of experience. Yeah, yeah okay. No, we, we, we initially just designed, the first one we actually nailed it. Uh, we've had guys that kind of kind of reverse engineered and he says, yeah, you, guys, it's, you pick up enough airplane parts in your life and you pick up enough bike where you just know, you know what you can get away with. So a lot of it's just based on experience. And then as we've reversed engineered, we kind of said, okay, yeah, or mm. we basically back stuff up. But for the most part, we're just running on experience Experience, but we're just generally been right. So, so. For, for the G2, you got the propeller, working on that right now, what's next? Next thing is going to be, uh, you know, driving it. We want to drive it to death and make sure that the, the system works. And I want to take this out and spin it up and test the bearing system on it. I haven't spun it yet, like I said, and I want to make sure this thing's really robust and beat it up on the ground. And if it behaves really well, then I'll go ahead and take it in the air. This, you're pretty confident about the safety of this on the ground and in the air? Yeah, that was a big part of it because, um, well, first of all, on the ground, as a motorcycle, I wanted something a little safer than most. Uh, and again, that's why, again, we have two front wheels, mm -hmm. which keeps you from basically keeping the front end on the ground. I also have seat belts on it, and uh, I've crashed this thing five or six times. You can see the scrubs on it. We, yeah. we, we've, we've augered it in a bit, you know, just because we really put it to the limit. And, uh, but nobody's ever been scratched with it. We've got seat belts on it. That's really helpful. Um, uh, gyroplanes have, uh, historically, they've had some problems with pitch stability. And what happens is people build uh, the aircraft, basically the pilot and the engine are right close to the center. And so the thing is, if you're flying forward and it, it tips forward, it just rolls like a ball. Mm -hmm. What I've done here is I've really extended, actually, the weights all the way to the front where the pilot's here and the engine's all the way to the back. And what that means is it's sort of like when someone's walking with a, uh, with a, with a, uh, a pole. On a tightrope. Exactly. Yeah. What it does is it spreads that weight out. So now the pitch stability is a lot there's a lot more moment arm, and so this thing is a lot more stable as far as pitch. And then, um, again, the gyroplane, by, by design, if, you've, if the engine fails, mm -hmm. then, uh, then you're still flying, okay? You and just then, glide back to the ground. Yeah, the motor's behind the propeller, so that means if anything happens to rattle off of there, the, the propeller will blow that part out the back rather than have it go through the prop. Most, air, most gyroplanes, they have the engine in front of the propeller. Right. And so if a, a hose clamp or something comes out, that hitting a carbon prop can actually break it and then you're in a really imbalanced situation. And so with this, not only do we get enormous amounts of cooling from the propeller blowing over the motor, but it's just one more fail safe. If something comes off the back or the muffler rattles off, then. And you don't need a lot of space to, you know, to land it. No, it'll all. land in about the space of its blades. Yeah, 20 feet or 50 feet. Wow. But uh, if, you know, if you've got a good wind, uh, you can actually land almost vertically. And, and I've actually done flights where I've been rolling backwards uh, on landing, actually, because the wind is greater than our landing speed. So. so how'd you get started in all this? Like, you know, you did rocket before you yeah you I kind of started on rockets and airplanes and then I never have uh, had a real interest in cars whatsoever but I did build uh, I worked with Craig Reedlove on his land speed racing car so that was kind of my first car was a supersonic one and that was a lot more <laughs> the like first car is a supersonic one. yeah but it was a little closer to the stuff I understood so I was able to add some value uh, and again cars per se I don't really like them I mean I, I use them but I'm not a big fan of them and I wouldn't fix up an old one but I do like the opportunities with uh, uh, again able to use a, a lot of technology that already exists and basically by Ouija board or whatever, you know, mix it up a little bit. So, and this one is actually one I really want to have, which is really why I'm building it, you know. So what, what's in the future for Gyro Psycho? Well, Psycho I'm hoping that racing in the near term, what I'd right. really hope for is that basically, this thing is at the point where most tracks will deal with something that's about 200 miles an hour. Right. They don't You're talking about race tracks, NASCAR. Yeah, I mean, you go to, uh, 
they uh, Indianapolis every year they make the car slower so that they don't have to make a bigger track, right? Mm. So they keep them about 200. Well, th this bike's certainly capable of being around a 200 mile an hour machine, 200 or better, to be honest. And um, so what I want to do is basically build a few of them and start racing them so that we can do really, really rapid development. And, and uh, all that development will go back into the design and that, at that point we'll have something that will be really close Nothing to Nothing like competition to spur innovation. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the competition meaning not just on the track somewhere, but I could just say, look, uh, you know, I'll, I'll race you to, uh, to Maine. You know, we'll Cross stop, country, yeah. yeah. We'll make five stops along the way. We'll fly over the uh, Grand Canyon. Uh, I'll meet you at some uh, hotel, you know, in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And then the next morning we'll get breakfast and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put you to the wall the next day. And then after you do a few of those and you, and you basically get to the point where they're completely robust and the only thing you're changing is the gas, then, uh, then you're at a point where you're really onto something. That's real freedom. I hope so. Yeah, though that's a dream. Well, that's what we got. <laughs> well, Desert, thanks you so much. Thanks for knowing. Yeah, this is amazing, and good luck making it to Maker Faire. We'll brother. see you there in New yeah, York. Done, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks a lot. We'll see you guys next time on Tested.com. Bye.